Welcome to another CHRO Conversation, hosted by the Center for Executive Succession at the Darla Moore School of Business. I am your host, Anthony Nyberg, and today we are speaking with Lucien Alziari. Lucien is the Executive Vice President and CHRO of Prudential Financial, a Fortune 50 financial services company. Prior to Prudential, Lucien was the CHRO of AP Muller Maersk, a global shipping and energy conglomerate with about 90,000 employees and operations in over 130 countries worldwide. Prior to that, he was the CHRO of Avon Products. He also serves on the board of directors of Clark's, a UK-based global footwear company where he serves as the chair of the remuneration committee. Thank you very much for joining us. Welcome back to sunny South Carolina. Thank you. We, we always appreciate having you here in town. So uh, you've been, of course, remarkably successful at a number of different uh, companies as a CHRO. Can you say a little bit about what's different between, say, the role of those that report to you and your role as a CHRO? Well, I, th I think the first thing that uh, I always make sure is that I've got a world-class team, and that's, that's sort of fundamental to the approach that I, I take as, as a leader, and I would advocate that to any leader, is just make sure you've got an absolutely crackerjack team. Then I, I, I think um, what I try and do is, is have the team feel like we collectively um, have ownership in, for, in my case, for the HR strategy, the HR our priorities and how we execute that um, as a team. So each of them has their own areas of expertise and um, their own specific uh, deliverables that they're accountable for. But it needs to be in the context of we as a team uh, own an overall strategy, we as a team are accountable for how that overall strategy makes a difference to the business of Prudential. And the reason why I like that is because then everybody's kind of playing up half a level. So um, in addition to being very successful at the job that they have, they're also getting to think about the overall priorities for the company and uh, kind of getting a, a first experience of well, what would it be like to be a chief HR officer. So, it, so that's one of the ways you're helping develop people to think this year. Yep. So what are some of the real differences between being in the, the role of chief HR officer versus, versus not yet being in that role? Well, uh, I guess I've done this three times now, and, and, and I think there are probably four key differences that, that happen when you finally become the chief HR officer. Uh, firstly, you know, you're leading a function. Um, and uh, we all grow up with experiences of, of leaders that uh, have led us and we all have points of view on, well, I wouldn't have done it that way, or well, now's your chance, right? So uh, the first thing is leading a function. Number two uh, is it, it's probably going to be the first time where you're working with a CEO kind of exclusively. Uh, you'd have had interactions with them before, but now you're kind of up close and personal with a CEO. and. You know, CEOs are a, uh, they're a distinct breed. They're, they're not normal human beings. It, it, that is what makes them extraordinary leaders. Uh, and so learning how to uh, partner with, uh, you can guarantee they're gonna be exceptionally gifted uh, people, but they're typically really good at a couple of things and they're not so good at a couple of things as well. And so learning how to partner with a CEO is a, is a new experience. For most people, you're learning um, how to work with a board for the first time. Um, if you grew up in executive compensation, you may have come. You, you may have had good experience with the compensation committee. If you've worked in talent, you may have worked on succession plans or whatever. But it's just different than being the HR leader that that sort of owns the relationship with the board. Um, and then the fourth one, but I would say uh, the one that is overlooked, but is actually the most important one is, now you are part of the leadership team of the business. And I think one of the traps um, is that you, you get too drawn into, I'm running the function. What the company needs most from you is uh, be a leader for the business. And if you're an effective leader for the business, then you'll get a very good sense of what is it that HR needs to do to enable the business to win. And everything that you do is driven by the context of, you know, what's the strategy for the company? Are you part of formulating that? 
is this a strategy that is actually informed with the capabilities and the talent that you're growing within the company? I just think that takes you to a completely different level of the game. So that sounds like a really hard balancing act. Yep. You're the leader of your own function, so you're the head of a team, yep. but you're also a member of another team, and they may not always have perfectly aligned goals, yep. I, I'm guessing. I mean, I guess, assume part of your role is to get those goals as aligned as yep. possible. Yep. But are there are there other things you need to do to, to walk that tightrope? If it is a tightrope, I don't even know. Well, I think it, it's always a balancing act. Um, but uh, if you come at this with the mindset of, I'm a business leader, my, my fundamental role is to help this business succeed. And businesses succeed as a whole, not function by function or unit by unit. All right, and so, uh, my fundamental job is to be part of understanding what makes this company as a whole win. Um, and then always kind of retrofit from that to what's the work, what's the value that HR uh, can most bring that will make the biggest difference to our ability to win. Part of what you're doing as a chief HR officer, but it, it would be the same with any of your, your peers, is you're making choices about where to prioritize and you're making choices about when not to prioritize. And I think that's the other side of this is uh, choiceful means what you're gonna do, but also what you're not going to do. Um, and whenever your colleagues can see what I would call a line of sight between the work that HR is doing and enabling them to win in their respective businesses, you'll be credible. And if they don't, you'll be doing HR stuff. So one of the things we hear from people that are not yet in the CHRO a lot is that their CHRO is not spending enough time with them within the function. And is that because of this that you're that they're not they're not seeing it the same way in terms of uh, driving the the business success or thinking about it from that full strategic area? I'm sure there are you know a host of reasons that, that it, it explain people's individual circumstances I, I, I think um, you can get drawn into a lot of things when you're a, a, a CHRO and, and it's, it's like a whole new uh, ball game for you to be playing um, and I would say some people get drawn back into the familiar which is and they actually spend too much time with their HR team um, and not enough time with the business and the board and the CEO. Um, but you've got to keep a balance between that. So um, I think I make sure I'm spending enough time with my HR leaders. They might say I'd spend too much time with them, but um, we kind of have a deal about what it is. Like I will never do anybody's job for them. They don't want that, I don't want that. So we spend a lot of time really just them telling me what's going on and I can sort of coach through issues. Um, and you're both helping the individual succeed at their own goals, but you're also making sure that the alignment across the team, because that becomes very, very important, that the team is cohesive and the function as a whole is showing up as cohesive to the company. Um, and that all comes from having really good people, but also people who are aligned across the team. So is this, when you were talking uh, earlier about really helping them, helping some of your reports see the strategic direction of the organization, does this help with this balance? Does that help them really see what you're trying to accomplish on, on a bigger picture? For sure, because uh, I think everybody, um, uh, if you've got the right people anyway, everybody responds well to sort of what's the overall goal that both we are creating together and then we are owning together. And so, um, I, I talk a, a lot to people about, um, you know, are you a trade up leader or a trade down leader? Um, and a trade down leader is, um, you know, you look at some companies and everybody's doing the first half of their direct reports job, right? They don't see it that way. They would describe it as, I'm in there with my people, I'm working side by side with them, I'm coaching, I'm leading by example. Um, but the reality is they're doing the first half of their direct reports job. Um, and so the direct report, they've got no place to go other than I'll do the first half of my direct reports job. So gravity is sort of going down in the organization. Um, it's kind of a risk mitigation strategy at its root. 
Um, and the problem is nobody's learning anything, right? Um, and so I've very much advocated a trade-up leadership model, which is everybody does the first half of their boss's job, right? And, and that's the way that I try and lead my own teams. Now, it only works if you've got great people. Um, but in that environment, everybody's learning something, everybody's doing something for the first time, gravity's going up, um, and people are growing if they're the right people. And then when you get to conversations like succession planning, um, how do we feel about so-and-so in the chief HR officer's job? Well, you've already seen half of it, right? So you've already got very good intelligence and you've mitigated the risks uh, because you've seen people in practice. So I've just come to really believe in that as kind of an overall leadership mantra. So is that way of driving leadership success uh, throughout the organization? Is this something that you do to help the entire organization that you're helping that mantra, not just in, in HR, but across the entire organization? Yeah, I think one of the accountabilities of, uh, of being a chief HR officer is that you are trying to help the organization have a, a, a set of frameworks, a logic around um, how do we recruit, grow, develop people to produce great performance for the company. And if you believe that it's the right thing in your own uh, team, it's probably going to be the right thing for the company. Um, and um, so a lot of what I'm doing is being invited by uh, my peers to town halls or sessions with, with talent across different pieces of the business. And just a chance to um, explain these frameworks, help people. I mean, you're really recruiting, enrolling people into believing in these models because they're leaders and then they'll go and practice them with their teams. So you're just looking for, you know, how do you, uh, how do you get converts to, uh, to these frameworks? But they need to be not Lucian's frameworks, they need to be the executive team's frameworks. I, I talk uh, quite often to HR leaders about um, one of the temptations of our roles is, you know, they're powerful roles. You can make a big impact. Um, and I see sometimes people kind of get seduced by the power, right? And the, uh, you know, the high profile or whatever. And I just remind people often about these are stage left roles all right if you want to be front and center become a ceo all right but um one of my own tests for myself is um if my ceo in in my case um is standing in front of a uh, of a town hall or a senior management meeting and is advocating a particular point of view um and that point of view came from conversations that we've been having over the last few weeks. And when he's saying it, he forgets that it came from me. Then I'm successful, all right? Because then it's his or hers. I, I think, uh, you know, I joke with people that as a chief HR officer, your reward is in heaven, all right? Don't look for the limelight um, today because that isn't the nature of the role. That's a really hard lesson to really want to not get credit for something. That That's really... A, a, quite extraordinary I think well and look we're all human beings and we like to be uh, you know recognized for what we're doing um, but I, I think um, of all of the roles in in, in the senior team um, the CHRO is one where our success is the success of the team it, it's the fact that the organization embraces the thinking or the initiatives that we're advocating for. Um, and then recognizing we actually don't execute most of that ourselves. We're trying to enroll people who are busy running businesses and functions, um, and they end up doing the work. So if they do the work, they should get the credit. So you've mentioned a few times that you're there to help drive the business success. So, and you've been in three really extremely different businesses as the chief human resource officer. Yep. Can you say how, and describe a little bit about how you go about even um, getting a grip on what the business is when you make such a, a remarkable change in, in industry even? Yeah, it, it happened more by accident by, than by design. Um, but uh, it, 
it, it's actually rather than just um, going to a new industry quite often the companies that we join are a collection of different businesses so it's not like it's one business um, when I was at Maersk there were seven or eight very different businesses Prudential Financial today uh, five different lines of business so um, at one level you're trying to understand the industry but really what you're trying to do is understand how does each business compete within its own space and so through force of circumstance trying to make sense of these businesses I, I've, I've really developed kind of a logic that um, I try and make sense of myself and so it always starts with um, you know what's the strategy of the business what's going to make this business win right um, how does it compare versus its competitors is it positioned well um, and really understanding the strategy which is which is really about sort of where do we play and how do we think we're going to win in in a particular space or market or geography um, and then I go from strategies to um, an understanding of capabilities and um, the, ca the capabilities would be almost the physical things that the company needs to do to execute on that strategy so digital as a capability franchising sales force effectiveness you know whatever it is in that particular environment and I'm trying to get a sense of what do we need to do um, just as well as our competitors um, where is good good enough um, and then what are those two or three areas within a business that are the true areas of competitive advantage? And there's never more than two or three. What do we need to be brilliant at in order to beat our competitors? Um, and once I've got that understanding of strategy and capabilities, that really informs the definition then of what does talent mean in this business? Because now it's business defined. Um, and so once I've got that definition clear of what does world-class talent mean in the asset management business or the retirement savings business, um, you can get very, very precise then on the, the plans that you're building around uh, talent attraction development. And then I always try and get to a list of 25 critical roles that I carry around in my head. All right. And they're the 25 roles that, for me, make the disproportionate impact on whether the business is going to succeed or, or not succeed. And I'm pretty religious about it. If those roles are the most critical roles uh, for the company, do we have truly world-class people in those roles? If so, what do we do to keep on growing them and challenging them? If not, what is it that we need to do to get to 25 critical roles with world-class talent? And so with that framework, which is very interesting in terms of thinking about how the business succeeds, as part of the executive leadership team, do you find yourself trying to get the, the rest of the team to adopt that framework for themselves as their own? Is this, is this more a personal way of, of oh, understanding no, the no, business? No, no. no, again, I think what we're trying to bring is a logic with which talent gets managed in the organization. So we have a lot to learn from chief financial officers. Chief financial officers operate with a logic of um, you know, accounting and performance forecasting, how capital is accounted for. It's all embedded in the business. The business guys understand it. They know that they can't change the rules. Everybody understands what the logic is and they operate against that. And I think the big opportunity for us in HR is what's the logic with which we manage talent in the company. Um, and so, of course, if I believe this is the right framework, then my first um, obligation, accountability, is to align my senior team colleagues. Again, because I don't manage the people. They manage the people. They make the, the people decisions. I don't. I, I'm really, really clear about that. Um, but I'm accountable for the overall quality of decision-making about talent in the company. And in order to fulfill that accountability, I need to have colleagues who are um, bought into this logic, see that it actually, uh, from their perspective, see that it really does help them succeed as business leaders. So one of the things you've said a, a few times also is, I mean, you described it, that your win is if the executive leadership team is doing well. Yep. 
So that necessarily implies that the ELT is actually a team, yep. which many people think of yep. more as just individual performers. So, so you, you clearly agree that it, it's a team. And then what, what kind of things can we be doing to really develop or strengthen that team? Yeah, I think it varies by company and it, it varies based upon um, sometimes if you're in a holding company environment, you're actually less of a team than if you're an integrated um, operating team where you, you know, you're actually executing things together rather than overseeing different kinds of businesses. So I, I don't think it's the same in every environment, but um, nevertheless, um, in either environment, people want to look at their senior leadership team and see that they're a team, that they, um, they've got each other's backs, that they enjoy working with each other, that they are all committed to the overall strategy of the company. You know, this is the CEO's accountability. This isn't mine, but uh, uh, obviously I, I want the CEO to be making this a priority and the good ones do. Um, I've seen different leaders do it in very different ways. Um, I think one uh, common characteristic is the team needs, needs to spend enough time with each other uh, to be a team and to sort of get beyond the formality to starting to understand each other as individuals. Um, and so I've been in some environments where at Prudential we meet twice a week for two hours. So we spend a lot of time the with each other. The entire team? Yes, yeah, there's eight hours. of us and okay. we spend, um, now obviously if we're traveling or whatever, it, we're not there 100% of the time, but we, we spend two hours uh, twice a week as a leadership team. Um, not agenda driven, um, more um, obviously reviewing proposals or whatever's coming from the organization. But a lot of it is just what's going on around the company. And that's our way of uh, keeping up with each other, making sure nobody's gonna get surprised and making sure we've got alignment. I've seen others where the senior team meets once per month. It's very agenda driven. Um, there I think the team building takes place outside of the leadership team meetings. It, it's gotta be the sort of social connections and uh, the glue that you build outside through um, uh, the, the frequency of meetings that you have with each other. So whatever's being done in terms of the frequency of meetings, I think the, the other thing that I try and do is make sure that I've got my mm -hmm. own independent um, frequency of one-on-one -on -one meetings with my colleagues. Um, and some it's, you know, once a month, others it's once a quarter, but you need to have an opportunity just again to sit face to face, let's make sure what's going on uh, for both of us. Um, sometimes to uh, just kind of share data, what are you seeing, here's what I'm seeing. Um, and I think it, all of that is building a sense of just basically human trust in each other that, um, you know, you can work together effectively. It doesn't mean you have to agree on stuff all the time, but you know where you're aligned and where you've got work to do, and that can be done in a very kind of respectful way. So it sounds like so many things that this is a little idiosyncratic to each company, and so there's not a, there's not a clear minimum time that groups need to spend together, but they have to develop that trust to work functionally together. Yeah, I, I don't think there's kind of a playbook that you just roll out. I, I would say that um, time together is important. Um, and the nature of C-suite roles is we're all busy um, and it's easy to overlook that. And you just need to create capacity um, to have those check-ins with each other. And, and going back to talking about the CHR role specifically, one of the things we know from our own research is that uh, CHROs, unlike the function of CEOs or CFOs, for instance, are much more likely to come from outside than inside the organization. The number is something like 70% of CHROs come from outside, as you yourself did. Um, do you have any thoughts on why the function that actually is designed to be thinking about succession so well, we seem to bring from, the, or is brought in from the outside by new CEOs um, more often than even other functions. Yeah, I, I think it's a combination of things. I, I think if, um, if we are honest, um, I don't think uh, HR always does a great job 
at um, building its own succession. So it's like being the plumber in the Little plumber's bit, house. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's one thing that I've taken um, particular joy in, actually, is, is sort of working on who are my successors. Um, and, um, you know, I've been privileged to work with some fantastically um, talented people who, who've gone on to do really, really big roles over time. In fact, I, I think you said a number. I think you gave me um, 15, was that? Depends on how you count it. It's like 12 to 15. That have um, gone on to become CHROs. Big, um, significant uh, CHROs. And, and, you know, just want to be clear about this. They got the job because of who they are, um, not because of what I did. But it's nice that they called and that we're still in contact with each other. And, and, and this uh, is clearly important to you. I mean, you oh, really matters. take great yeah, pride it in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, some of it is, is kind of paying it forward because people did that for me. Um, it's what helped me grow. I got opportunities that I wasn't ready for. Um, and I've ended up having, you know, just a, a career that, that has been a, a wonderful set of experiences. And I want to pay that forward. It's also really good business, right? And uh, the great thing about what we do is uh, doing the right thing, um, and uh, making a business when they come together really, really nicely. So yeah, I believe in this. So in that role of mentor, or at least helping people in their careers, you've been as successful as you've been in, in doing other things. Do you, are there specific things you're doing that you, you think have really contributed to that success? Of, and that success of helping others get where they want to go? First, they get great people. So this only works with really, really good people. So it's that all about selection. It though. always comes yeah. back to kind of who's on the team and being very choiceful and, and deliberate about that. I have a, a, a deal with my people, which is, um, you know, you, you will come to trust that I've got your best interest at heart. And I really do take seriously the responsibility that I'm going to try and help you become as good as you can be that will not always be fun all right there will be moments where it will be challenging I may not be giving feedback in the most uh, perfect way but if you trust that I've got your best interests at heart um, we're going to do very well together and the other side of that is you, you've got to be open to wanting to uh, to get better, which again is is one of the characteristics of, of really, really good people. And uh, I don't do anybody's job for them. They don't want that. I don't want that. Um, and so I'm much more there to help them understand how to be successful, support them, cajole them, nudge them, whatever it is at that particular time. But underneath it all, to, to, to help them not to follow my point of view, but just as much to develop their own point of view. Well, it's, it's an extraordinary accomplishment. Um, one of the things I've also, that I've taken from you personally is your comment, and you made it earlier too, about when you're understanding the business of what is good enough and understanding what is good enough. Can you explain a little bit more about what that means to you? Yeah, and it's a concept that takes a little bit of explanation and, and the words matter. So I never talk about average is good enough. I talk about good is good enough. Um, but there are many aspects of what we do in companies where, frankly, we over invest in capabilities where good would be good enough. Um, and um, do you have any examples you could share? Uh, yeah, I mean, w within my my own function, I, I'll be making choices about uh, again, if you go back to the logic, um, there will be two or three things where we need to be truly world class, right? And so I'm going to be very choiceful about um, what are those two or three things, and I'm going to make sure I've got absolutely world class talent that we're investing, um, you know, with, with some uh, rigor against those. And then there are other areas where um, it needs to be done very well, but it doesn't need to be the best in the world, all right? Um, and so this, this notion of um, doing things well, but not needing everything to be world-class is important. Now, business leaders actually get that when you, when you talk about it in those terms. So um, if companies don't think like that and they're trying to be world-class at everything, I can just promise them it won't ever happen. Um, 
and businesses that um, and it happens a lot businesses that over invest in areas where good would be good enough are building in cost and they're building in complexity and the real risk they've got is they don't have the resources left to invest in those areas where they truly need to be world class. So how do you, because you said it, that the words really matter and you never say average, yep. but how do, you, how do you keep your own employees from coming back to you and be like, well, I thought this was good enough? Good needs some explanation and, and good means we do this very well. And, um, you know, at Prudential, we are proud. We, uh, we've got really good people and whatever we choose to do, we do it really well. Right. And then there are some other things that we choose to do where we've got to be the best in our industry. Um, and each business leader has got to make choices about where are those sort of two or three areas that require this sort of doubling down of investment of financial resources and talent resources. And along these lines, and you, you talked about strategy really having, I mean, and companies having you know, two or maybe three things that they're trying to be yep. world class at. I've heard you talk about, uh, it's almost like a rule of three, that you should be focusing on three things. And I, yep. I've understood you to say that from the organization level and even maybe the personal level or the yep. team level. Can you say a little bit more about, about that? Yeah, it, it's a belief that um, I've acquired over time, but I have kind of high conviction around now. And, and it, it's that we're all going to be remembered for three things. I don't know what those three things are, but I can promise anybody, uh, when, when people look, at, look back on what you've done, that's either as a company or as a leader, they're only gonna remember three things. And really it's because organizations have attention deficit syndrome, just like human beings. They can't remember more than three things. And if you try and do 10 things, the likelihood is you're gonna try 10 small things and you'll get lost in trivia. So um, I believe having watched um, really successful leaders. One of the, the distinguishing characteristic is their ability to focus on a few things and make big changes to big things, not small changes to small things. And uh, I talk then a lot to my team about, okay, so what's the top three list? All right, what are the three things that you can do that can make the most fundamental impact to how this company wins? Um, and when I'm selecting people or um, talking to them uh, in, in, in terms of their own development, it tells me a lot because um, the choice of, of three things, it becomes pretty determining then in whether you're going to be successful. So in order to be the right three things, um, you've got to have the intellect to sort of get to the underlying cause, not treating things uh, at the symptom level. Um, you've got to have enough business understanding so they're the right three things for the business and how the business competes. Then you've got to have um, the right kind of influencing and alignment capability because at the moment you've got um, a set of three ideas. They need to become the business's uh, set of priorities. Um, and then uh, I say to people, if those are the right three things, spend 80% of your time on those for the next three years, five years. So do you have the stamina to actually see those things through and make sure that they deliver the results that you're trying to get? So do you think this is something that we should be carrying out throughout the organization? So yes. you say your team and then individuals and the individuals reporting to them yes. and all the way down. Yeah, I think most, um, most companies get in trouble by trying to do too much rather than too little. And so does this require then some regular refocusing of saying, what are sure. your three, where are you spending your time and sure. how do we get back to those three? Sure, and the three, you know, I say to people, I only want 80% of your time, you know, real life can take up the other 20%, but you're gonna be remembered for uh, the three things that, that you focus on. So let's make sure they're the right things and that you actually devote all of your creativity to those rather than all of the other distractions that happen. Does this mean we have to empower our employees to remind us when we ask them for more and more and more that, uh, to remind us that that falls outside of the realm of their three things? For sure, I, I, and I, I think therefore that the most important thing that you do as a new chief HR officer is just be very deliberate about what those 
three priorities are going to be because you can't go back and change it every six months you're just going to distract the organization and create confusion and so we talk a lot about okay we we've spent quite a lot of time and effort and alignment with the senior team on these are the choices we've made in terms of priority so I hope you see some alignment between the work that you're engaged in and the three priorities that I'm sharing with you because it's really important that there is that line of sight. Um, and if there isn't, then probably let's have a talk about what it is that you're focusing on and I can help maybe build that line of sight more, more clearly. Thank you very much for joining us. As always, I continue to learn from you and we deeply appreciate having you here on campus. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. You just listened to another CHRO conversation. Today, Lucian Alziari of Prudential Financial shared his views about how HR drives business success. He also reminded us of the importance of recognizing how HR should prioritize the issues that help the organization win, including ensuring that the company has the necessary capabilities and talent. On behalf of all of us who are associated with the Master of Human Resources program, and the Center for Executive Succession here at the University of South Carolina. Thank you for joining us.